My name is Peter. Um, I work for Netcope Technologies. Um, and there was already a presentation on FPGA-based SmartNIC. And now you have listened uh, to presentation on P4 programmability. So I could pretty much finish uh, right here, right now. But I'm going to uh, tell you something about uh, what we do at Netcope to enable P4 programmability uh, of FPGAs, where SmartNICs are particularly interesting uh, use case. So why FPGAs and P4? The goal is to offload uh, packet processing or to accelerate the packet processing. Um, key components of that are reducing latency and jitter, which is very good fit for FPGAs because they are deterministic in their processing, very much like hardware, even though programmable, and release cores for application workloads so that the cores are not eaten up by um, implementing uh, access control lists or pushing packets back and forth. As I mentioned, FPGAs are very good for processing of uh, data streams um, to, to execute pipelines. If you think about FPGAs, you basically should think about a uh, custom-built pipeline with instructions that do only what you have told it to do. There are no left uh, unused instructions. So the whole FPGA is uh, pur purpose-built or purpose-programmed for, for that specific workload. But they are very hard to program. Um, how many of you have ever seen VHDL or Verilog code? All right. So for those who, who haven't, uh, there's a small um, code sample on, on your right. And uh, these, I don't know, maybe 20 lines implement a very, very simple inst functionality. It's just an end. So to describe something like this in, in a VHDL or Verilog takes a lot of code. So um, P4 is a very good fit because it's uh, target independent and it's abstract language. Um, the explanation of, uh, of that was given uh, by Christian and Antonin, so um, thank you for that, guys. Um, and it's also open source. It's an open source language, and it prevents vendor lock-in. So one day you may want to have an FPGA-based SmartNIC doing some data plane processing. The other day you may want to have a couple ARM cores doing that in some embedded appliance. Or if you're in a data center, you may want to have uh, like a high-end setup with a P4 programmable switch chip. So, so that really gives you a flexibility once your data plane is expressed in P4. So benefits of the marriage uh, of P4 and FPGA, FPGAs. This is really about exposing the FPGA technology to software developers. So no longer guys who know how the VHDL and Verilog uh, are needed because we've got P4. Uh, so now you can describe the packet processing in a much simpler way. FPGAs are deterministic in their, in their execution. So the performance is very good. Um, also, as you've got a specific P4 code, the uh, P4, I mean, sorry, the FPGA bitstream will only do whatever is there in the P4 code, and all the resources will be allocated for your specific pipeline. So you don't have any unused pieces of, F of chip, of silicon, doing nothing so that's a very good fit. And, and you, can, you can have uh, various combinations. You can have large tables of uh, small capacity, sorry, <laughs> small number of tables of large capacities, but also large number of tables with, uh, with small capacities. It re really depends on your workload, on what you want to do. Also, the parsing and deparsing uh, part of the pipeline can, can be whatever way you want it to be. 
Another good uh, point of FPGAs is that there are multiple vendors out there and they have a broad offering. So you can pick uh, FPGAs that will fit into applications that need 10 gig processing or you can go for FPGAs that are larger and more expensive but can handle multiple hundred gigs. So that allows you to scale. Also, you, you have FPGA chips where there are dynamic memories on the same, same die or um, same piece of silicon. So you can scale the FPGA or you can pick FPGA that scales uh, and, and fits to, to the particular application and workload. And as was mentioned, um, P4 is extensible through externs. So if someone wants to do any type of encryption or for example pattern matching which are not at the moment part of the language you can always plug in these features as, as external libraries, external calls or, or IP blocks in, in case of uh, FPGAs. Um, in order to, to show you um, how typical application in P4 looks like we took a segment routing as an uh, example use case. Um, segment routing is a source routing technology uh, where packet carry uh, information about uh, their um, path through the network and this way you are getting a programmability uh, through a data plane operations, uh, network programmability through the data plane operations. And that requires the ability to work with uh, packet headers to rewrite them and do specific modifications of individual header fields. How does uh, such a code uh, typically looks like? So as part of the P4 code, there's a definition of uh, headers. Um, nothing surprising here. Probably everyone has seen how Packet, packet headers like Ethernet or IPv6 look like. And then the other part of the um, P4 pipeline or P4 code input is a, is a description of a parse graph. So once you have definition of these uh, packet header types, you define how uh, these individual protocols are stacked uh, one upon each other. And that's part of the code definition, so it's really up to you how you shuffle the, the packet headers. The next part of the code uh, are match action tables, which are performing actions on packets based on the uh, matches that were described uh, in, in the headers and parser definition. So here, what we are doing, we are basically rewriting a, uh, some, uh, we are rewriting IPv6 destination address with, with another field, field extracted from the packet, and we are decrementing a uh, index, um, which, which tells us what's going to be the next uh, destination IPv6 address. And then uh, we define how, how the uh, individual actions will be, will be executed on the packet. So um, down here you can see the uh, control kind of flow uh, of how the individual tables are applied on the packet. And here on the, uh, sorry, on the right side you can see um, few more actions as well as uh, table definition which says that uh, we are looking for specific IPv6 uh, destination addresses and we have a list of actions that we have defined here in the code and we will be applying them based on the rules that are provided at the runtime. So one example architecture or hardware platform where you can run uh, P4 pipeline is, uh, is this uh, Intel uh, FPGA-based card, 
which has an, not only FPGA chip, but also uh, Fort Will chips that are there to implement the uh, standard DPDK interface and, and, and provide all the uh, integration with virtualization technologies. But it also has the uh, FPGA chip sitting closer to the network interfaces. And that's where you can uh, kind of put in the P4 pipeline and, and toy with uh, the packet processing. That's where we implemented this uh, or uh, programmed the pipeline that was described on the previous slides. So at the end, it's a, it's a very straightforward packet processing. The packet arrives from the network, goes through the pipeline where it's parsed, match actions are applied, and then the packet is deparsed and can be sent back to the network or to software for additional processing. Now, with this uh, programming model, um, there are many different use cases that can be addressed. You can do various tunnel processing. Um, you can collect statistics on the traffic if you have uh, enough of memory on the FPGA or on the smart NIC. Um, you can do various types of load balancing and you, you will have a control of how that load balancing works because you can define what are the input fields and you can also define the, uh, let's say, the load balancing strategies. You can also perform uh, traffic shaping, virtual switching, which was mentioned here before. Very popular use case is in-band network telemetry and all of these use cases kind of map to a packet processing pipeline. Now, how to connect uh, such a pipeline to, a, to the rest of the world? So we, we considered RTE flow as being one of the options. And to just briefly describe how our RTE flow looks like, um, the, f the rule in, in uh, RT flow consists of three components. First is attributes, then it's a matching pattern where you describe what kind of packet header fields you're looking for, and then there's a list of actions that will be performed or executed on, um, on the packets that matched the rule. Using the uh, Group attribute, it's, it's possible to kind of create a structure of tables and, and jump through these tables to, to achieve a kind of multiple match action tables type of processing. And there's a list of supported uh, matching patterns. Um, this is the list that uh, we extracted from, I believe, DPDK 18.5. And as you can see, it's, it's something which is given as part of the uh, um, DPDK definition. There are also additional special matching patterns, but the, uh, the list of them is, uh, is given up front, it's limited. Now, when it comes to actions, um, there's a nice number of those, um, but they all depend on the target hardware because RT flow is an API that exposes features of, of specific hardware targets. Now, there are actions that uh, are used to direct packets, so you can use it to, to route the packets or, or forward the packets to specific queues, uh, to RSS, to physical virtual functions, port IDs, and so on. And there are also constructs for uh, collecting statistics, so things like counters and meters. Um, and there are also actions that are pretty much uh, following the open flow uh, standard. Um, so, so to somehow summarize RTE flow, as was mentioned uh, during the earlier presentation, um, 
enables very dynamic scenarios, but follows uh, open flow standard. Um, P4, on the other hand, is a successor to open flow, and uh, everything is basically defined in the code. So the protocols are defined in the, in the code, as well as the individual operations are defined in the code. So in order to fully expose the P4 flexibility, um, it would be great to have uh, different uh, API than RT flow, and uh, in, by this uh, kind of conclusion, I only support the uh, previous presentation done by uh, Christian and Antonin, and that's uh, all from me. So thank you for your attention, and uh, I'm open to questions. Hey, just a quick question. In terms of, like, one of a lot of the advantages here to be showing is, is the flexibility in the P4 approach, but all of that seems to be, I don't know, I wouldn't say glossed over, but the complexity seems to have moved from the code to the backend compiler, and there's an assumption that the backend compiler of, it be it translating from the, the JSON or directly from P4, to the target can solve all of the problems. Uh, I, so I, I, I would just like to get a comment on that since you, you, I think Nets, Netcope look at both, have multiple different target backends in terms of FPGAs. Is it like, and from, from I, I haven't written RTL myself, but I've worked a lot with teams who have, but there's always seems to be huge effort put in into fixing timing, looking at utilization of the FPGA. And there seems to have always been this promise of different code generation solutions for the RTL problem. Mm. Does P4 really actually help on that, or does it just so frame the problem in a different way? So there are, there are kind of two parts of that question. First one is about simplifying the development process and hiding the complexities of uh, the timing and all that FPGA workflow, which is really the goal of, of the compiler. So the compiler produces code that is uh, easy to synthesize. So it's heavily pipelined and it's optimized for throughput. So this way, really, the goal is to take the P4 code and require as little input from the user as possible. So really a lot of effort has been put into creating, um, let's say, instructions or efficient implementations of each P4 code constructs so that they can map well into FPGA. This was done by domain experts, FPGA programming domain experts. So really, the, if you think about, for example, any other programming language and any other compiler, it's, it's always about kind of hiding the complexities and, and, and doing this uh, optimization or, or, or some tough work by, by those who are domain experts and exposing just the simplified language to, to, the, con to the user. And the other part of the question, I believe, is uh, related to um, understanding where you want to execute your P4 code, because there's always a difference between whether you are running your code on an ARM, if it's a C code, I, I just want to give you an analogy. If it's a C code, there's going to be a difference if you're running it on, a, on an ARM-based device like this or on a high-end Xeon with uh, 64 cores. So that's something you need to bear in mind, but it's more like a, when you're sizing your solution, that's, that's where, when you need to think about um, what kind of memory will I need? Uh, what kind of uh, resources will I need to be able to handle this uh, workload? Thank you.